scale of two Alabama Giants. So before I get into it, there's a lot of people I need to acknowledge. Uh, International Crane Foundation being one. Uh, I had to work very closely with them to even get this project off the ground. Wheeler, of course. So this is all taking place at Wheeler. So that kind of gives us a, a central scene here. Uh, of course, Department of Defense, they run Arsenal, but I really want to give a plug to my university, Alabama a and University, that to even give me the chance to work with these awesome species. And I don't think a and gets enough credit. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, I didn't know y'all did wildlife stuff. They didn't know they did forestry stuff. We have a lot going on at Alabama a and that a lot of people don't know about. And especially when it comes to non-game species, I think we're up there at the top in, in the state. You know, with Auburn, uh, University of Alabama, USA. Alabama a and is competing with those universities. We're going to talk about the quality and quantity of research that we're doing. Um, so happy to give them a shout out. Uh, also, the Land Trust of North Alabama, I really have to acknowledge, number one, for having me here. But it all, for me, starts here. So if you know, you know, but this is Fagan Springs up on the Monsanto Preserve. And I am a local. I was born in Huntsville, born and raised. Grew up in the Five Points area with East Clinton, Huntsville Middle, Huntsville High School, all that. But I was fortunate to live near a one of these preserves. So when I was growing up, I was able to get out and I can't tell you that little trailhead right across from Tollgate Apartments. Mm -hmm. That was my home. I right, spent so much time in the, in the woods. But you got to think back in the '80s, if it wasn't for like Montesano State Park or Wheeler, there wasn't a lot of places for people to actually get into the woods and hike unless you were doing it on someone else's property without them knowing, generally speaking. So to think of the resources that the Land Trust has provided to Madison County and beyond, giving, giving you all the opportunity to get out there and recreate, but also our youth. All right, So it's very, very important, because the youth are going to be the next people when it comes to conservation. And if it wasn't for me having this area as a kid, I would not be here today. All right? it, it shaped who I was. It gave me my love and passion for wildlife and our wild spaces. And uh, yeah, so uh, much gratitude for the Land Trust. So thank you for coming. Please continue to support the Land Trust if you haven't yet already. <clears throat> so we'll get into this talk, controversial conservation, the tale of two Alabama giants. And so let's just talk, talk about, OK, how are these species actually similar? We have a, a bird and we have a reptile. Well, first off, J.J. Audubon saw some kind of connection. So he depicts a whooping crane actually eating a baby alligator. Now, we don't really have any, uh, to my knowledge, any in the literature of this actually occurring, but it certainly could. Um, uh, whooping cranes are omnivores, they eat plants and animals. Um, but what we do know about the literature is that we know that alligators can predate cranes. So in this study, these are sand hill cranes that, that are shown in the pictures, but they do have evidence of alligators predating cranes and crane nests. And this paper actually was the first time to document alligators actually predating whooping crane nests. Okay, so if one possibly eats one, one we know eats the other, that must mean they share habitat. All right, now here's one of the, the sad things, and this is an old statistic, but from 1780 to 1980, it is thought that in Alabama alone, we lost about 50% of our wetlands. So you can imagine what that number is now. So wetlands are in decline across the board. Another thing they have in common is that they were heavily over-harvested. Whooping cranes, big flashy bird, once again, we talked about rib out in the sky. J.J. Audubon talks about how they're so tender and juicy and excellent eating. So not only were they being hunted for food, also for their feathers, you know, back in the, the fancy hats, uh, also they could be considered a nuisance by farmers because they were in, you know, picking up grains and in the, the croplands, then alligators on the other side too, harvested for the meat, harvested for their leather. Uh, they were also being sold off in the, the, the pet trade long, long ago. So a lot of pressures on both these species, which wound them both being on the Endangered Species Act. Now I'm not going to go, you know, list by list, but just a little brief history. The Lacey Act um, protected blue green back in 1900. Then the, the Migratory Bird Conservation Act in 1937, and then what was Originally, the Endangered Species Preservation Act in 1966, which that became what we know as today as the Endangered Species Act, so it got grandfathered in. Very similar situation with American alligator, but I thought it was pretty interesting to note that Alabama was actually the first state to provide protection for the American alligator. Um, 
before Texas, before Florida, before Louisiana, Alabama was the first state back in 1941. But similar to the whooping crane, it was on that Preservation Act of 1966, grandfathered in 1973. But it was removed in 1987, but it was relisted as threatened due to similarity of appearance. Now this can go two of, one of two ways. There is another large reptile that is endangered here in the United States that look like alligators. American crocodiles. All right? Uh, we do not get those here, so don't worry about that. They're like way down south Florida. So that's, that's one reason, because alligators can look like crocodiles. But also, on a geographical scale, you might have a place like a parish in Louisiana where it has a very healthy population, but it could be right next to a parish where they are still endangered. So to, to clear up the confusion and worry about if you're in this location or that location, that's another reason why they're threatened uh, at this status. But they're also two giants. All right, so I'm sure many people have seen this guy in the news back in 2014. Uh, this was a world record, uh, 15 foot, 9 inches, over 1,000 pounds, and it was estimated on bone density. This guy was only 24 to 28 years old. All right, we're talking about almost half of his, what could be his lifespan. Imagine how big that guy could have gotten. Um, so they're very long-lived as well. On the whooping crane on the other side, they're the tallest bird in the United States. They can get up to five feet tall. So you can see over here, you want to see how big you are? And you got me. This is him with his neck hunched down. When he gets that head, uh, head hunched up, they're pretty tall. We're talking about a bird that can look at some of you in the eyes. Okay? <laughs> and they also can be very, very uh, large, uh, long-lived. So 24 year lifespan, longer in captivity, etc. So these birds have some things in common. So to set the, season, uh, the setting, this all takes place at Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge. I really want to give you some of the historical aspects of both these species, of, of why they're here, what they're doing, and uh, talk a little bit about some of the research that I've done. Usually I give academic talks, but I'm, trying, I'm not going to bore you with stats and bar graphs and anything like that. I want to make it more fun and just make it more of a story time for you all. But a little history about Wheeler. So Wheeler is a, a large, a large refuge located in Madison, Oregon, and Limestone counties. It was developed in 1938. It was kind of experimental at its time. It was the first refuge that was ever superimposed on a hydroelectric impoundment. So it was, we had the Gunnersville Dam, the Wheeler Dam. So it was kind of experimental in that time. It was mainly a refuge designated for waterfowl. That was one of its main purposes was water, waterfowl conservation. Uh, it's fairly large, it's 35,000 acres, uh, mostly aquatic, all right, but there are some far, far, uh, forest lands, there's uh, agriculture taking place on there, so this one that's going to take place in the, the, the whooping crane side, they do lease out some of that land to be farmed, but they have what's called a crop share system, and in that crop share system, basically, the farmer has to leave X amount of his harvest behind. And that's usually for supplemental feeding, once again, historically, for waterfowl. But we're seeing that we have other uh, animals using this resource quite heavily. So this is typically what you would see out in the wintertime. Um, it used to be, and it might still be, the highest density of overwintering waterfowl can be found at Wheeler. So beautiful scenery. Uh, but now what you can see in the background here, you see a whole bunch of cranes, a whole bunch of sandhill cranes. And these are fields that, you know, back when I was a kid, were mainly geese. Now we don't see as many geese, but we see a lot of sandhill cranes. So here's, we'll start with this one species, all about the alligator. So here's a question to you all. Please chime in. Uh, why are alligators controversial in North Alabama? Nobody knows how they got here. Nobody knows how they got here. Yeah. They're like coyotes. Huh? They're like coyotes. Like coyotes? Here. Well, are any of these gators from the ones they released uh, that they expected to have died out? All right, my question. so that brings up one of the main points. A lot of people, there was this thing called the release. And so one of the big controversies is people do not think they belong here. All right? So, and they, if you look at a distribution map, they would be right. So if you look here, this is the native range. According to USGS, you see all these little red spots, those are... Uh, think of watersheds in which an alligator has been found and they believe that it was either an escape pet or a release or not native, not supposed to be there. But we did have this thing called the big release, what well, I call the big release of 1979. 
So on June 2nd, 1979, we know that 55 alligators were caught from Lacassine a National Wild Refuge in Louisiana and were brought and released to, to Wheeler. Now, the public did not get wind of this until, you know, about a month later, and when this article came out. Uh, it was the first public record of this release. Uh, it states that the reason for this re release was to set up a reserve population in case something happened along the coastline, which was, you know, the main, main habitat. Uh, in this article, also, also gives our first evidence of poaching of alligators. So it's telling me, hey, we have alligators, and we also arrested somebody for killing an alligator. Pretty interesting. Now, in 19, uh, later on, Congressman Flippo, who was a congressman at the time, was not happy about this. He said, I didn't know about this. This is a mistake. This is not the right habitat. Um, basically, he wants them removed. This article also gives us a little bit more information that most of these the individuals released were less than a foot long. So we're talking about babies. So I'm going through the history just trying to piece, you know, how many were there? Where were they released? I'm trying to get the history of what actually happened. Also believe they would freeze to death. That's also one thing I hear quite a bit. It's too cold in North Alabama for them to survive. So basically, Congressman Flippo, he gets his way. The Department of Interior orders Wheeler to remove them. They comply. They said they would start removing them in the spring. Spoiler alert, they only caught like three or four or something like that, a very low number. But also gives us a little more information that at least three individuals were six to seven foot in length. Now, this is also controversial to me. All right, so say if you are releasing these alligators to create a new, po a new reserve population, then why are you releasing the majority of individuals with the highest mortality class out of them all? Mm -hmm. All right, your baby alligators are going to die off a lot easier than your big ones. Also, if it's to control beaver, which I find funny because we, you know, beaver were actually extirpated from the you know, state of Alabama back in the 1900s. We did a pretty good job of getting rid of them. Um, so bringing, bringing alligators to try to take over, it's, it's kind of funny. These one-foot gators aren't eating beaver. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times I laugh when I'll see an alligator and I see a beaver swim right by it. <laughs> anyway, I didn't find this until after my research was done. This is actually the narrative report that Wheeler came out with back in 1979. It gives us a little bit more information. Uh, the, all the releases were on the north side of the refuge. Five release sites, still can't find out exactly where they are. I have my guesses. Um, but also declares a, a, a positive public reaction to this, okay? And what I found funny, and once again, this is on a federal site, not mine, but someone had circled in a real boo-boo. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> um, I thought that was pretty funny. Anyway, after this, there's nothing in the news. P people might have talked about it, but it wasn't really out in the public, nothing, anything else. But 1995 was the very first article that I saw came out after this. And this is what I saw as a kid and got me interested in alligators. And you read the title, Alligators Remain in Alabama Years After Release. And ever since then, every couple of years, a sighting would be made, a newspaper is out there, or, or something's going on, it's being reported. It kind of stirs up this controversy, oh, they're not supposed to be here, not supposed to be there. What I wanted to do is I wanted to learn the, the community's uh, you know, perspective on this. What do they actually think? And nowadays, with technology, these Facebook posts, everything else, I can actually see how, what people are commenting. So I could go on and on about this, but you know, here's just one. You know, I look at the comments, and half and half were negative. You get some like, you know, I've never heard of them being on the endangered species list, so just, just misinformation. Get rid of them, destroy them all. The one I found funny was, I want to, if I want to go see a gator, I'll go to the zoo, kill them all, roll tide roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then you get some ones that you know, just keep fishing, no worries. And it's amazing how every time an article comes out, I'm still been assessing this, and how much more public, uh, public, uh, public, positive public reaction there is to these, to these alligators. I guess it's more commonly known. Like, okay, you know, just don't worry about hey, I'm in Florida. Y'all are worried about a gator, like for real. Um, so the, the reaction's gotten better. Um, this is the newest one, one of the newest ones. This is off Hazeland. So this is right near the new Grissom High School uh, in Huntsville. Um, and it's funny, I actually coached both those kids. Uh, baseball. Uh, but yeah, they, they're developing into this land, and when they opened up this land, I'm looking at those bodies of water, and I was like, I bet there's alligators in there. And sure enough, there was two, but it kind of creates a little controversy. Oh no, now they're in this near a, a new subdivision that they've been putting in, you know, everything else. Here's a good question Are they all from the big release? 
Well, the first one I can find in, in, in the records was from a newspaper in 1891. One was caught in the Tennessee River near the Florence area. Okay? So we do have some historical context. Wheeler themselves had taken logs of alligator sightings all the way starting back in 1964, so about 15 years before this release. Now, I, I, they have them pretty much every year. I cut some out of here for the sake of time. In 1966, a five-foot alligator was killed in Guntersville. So we got Florence, we have Wheeler, we have Guntersville. That's a huge swath of river right there, okay? Um, 1977, they thought they, I guess, were having a really harsh winter. They thought it was going to kill them all. Apparently, they did it because they responded back in 1978. So, me as a researcher, I always wanted to work with these species. Like, what can we do? And surprisingly, after four decades of this big release, nobody had done any research on it. And I was like, all right, I want to change this. I want to find out one, the historical component, which I just gave you a little bit of. Also, where are they? Where are they? How many are there? And that was a big one for me, because every time an article would come out, it would estimate the population being about 55 to 65 alligators. Huh. About the same number of alligators from the release. So what's going on? Is one, is that just a guess? <laughs> Probably. But does that mean something? Are they not breeding? Is there equal mortality versus breeding? Like, what's going on? Like, so I wanted to get a better idea of how many there actually were. Are they dangerous? We want to see what kind of behaviors they're exhibiting. And if I can provide any information to Wheeler and to others for long-term monitoring. So some of the methodologies basically go out at night with a flashlight and look for eye shine. <laughs> Alligators have really distinct red eye shine. And it helps with them in the water, so that kind of helps minimize other things that are, could be running around. Uh, we did this you know, during fall, uh, not, you know, spring, summer, and fall to see if there was a season that was better than others. Uh, we try to evaluate the size class to see, you know, if, obviously if you're seeing young ones, that means breeding is occurring. It's kind of hard to do size class because usually sometimes you only see the head mm -hmm. of an alligator, but there's kind of a cool trick. So basically for every inch that you can estimate from the snout to basically the eye is about a foot of alligator. So if you've got a snout, it's about six foot or six inches, about a six foot alligator. Not perfect, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb. We also wanted to see how, one, how far can we see these guys in the water? But also, how close could we get to them? All right, that kind of sort of establishes that behavior stuff. But for the population stuff, we had to take it a little bit more deep. Um, I don't waste much time too sciencey. Basically, we took about all the available wetlands that they had at Wheeler. So about almost 25,000 acres, very highly aquatic. <coughs> take that down to about how much we think might actually be available for alligators. So, and then we go in there and we have our survey routes. We can you know, calculate the amount of area we can actually see. And then we do kind of a rude, crude estimation. So they do this kind of for deer, too. So hey, if I go and I see one, one deer per acre, and I have 50 acres, I can estimate I have about 50 deer, right? So here's some of the results from this study. We can detect these guys from a long range. 450 meters, as long as it's, uh, it's clear, we can see these guys' eyes shine. We're seeing babies. In fact, the majority of our individuals are less than six foot tall. We're seeing them all the way from two to 12 foot. Uh, and I'm being conservative with that 12 foot. Uh, I hear people all the time, I saw a 15, I even had, had someone wearing a badge tell me he saw a 16 foot. I'm like, I don't know about all that. Um, but we're, also we were having more luck in the spring, early summer, less vegetation growing up, so, yeah. Now, how many are there? Now, it depends on what, which, you know, which one you look. I would say at least 121, or maximum population, I'd say maybe 144. But look at this population density. It says 0 0.01 alligators per acre. Not a lot. But we do have one area. We get 2.25 alligators per acre. So if I were to rely on that heavy number, we have a lot more than that. I would safely say we have 150, 175. Might see it's a lot more than what was originally estimated. But we're talking about a 35,000 acre refuge. All right? Are they dangerous? <laughs> well, yeah, they're alligators. They're big, huge apex predators. Of course, they're dangerous. But every gator has exhibited the healthy behavior which we want. You know, basically, they would they swim, they swim off, they sink, which is kind of unnerving. If you're in a boat and you see a big guy just sink down below you, so okay, when are you going to pop back up and where? But uh, yes, but they're exhibiting the behaviors that we want them to exhibit. Let's keep it that way. You know what they say? Don't feed the alligators a fed gator's a dead gator, and 
That's, that's the main thing. But they, they wanted nothing to do with us. We're out there. We're smacking the water. We're making baby alligator noises. We're doing everything we can to see if they can will come to us. And they're not. Um, we did try catching one. It did not go that well. And I'm glad we did not catch this one. Um, this is a, a big, huge gator. Uh, and you can't see. So some of y'all might know Kyle Arbarn from Native uh, Wildlife Project. Um, our habitat project. Basically, he built this trap. This trap is 10 foot long. This is the 5 foot mark here. That's 5 foot. So we're seeing the, pretty much the snout of that alligator all the way. We're not even talking about the hind legs and the tail. So if that got in the trap, I'm pretty sure I'd probably just open up the other side and let that guy go. All right? Um, but one little fun story. So this is actually a fun story. You can see these guys year round. As long as it's warm enough. Today, if it was sunny, you probably could have seen one if you're looking in the right spot. I've seen it in December. In fact, there was one time I was filming whooping cranes in December. I look in between me and them, and in the water, I see something. That gets my binoculars, sure enough, there's an alligator just chilling. These guys were in February, right? So the whooping crane season had kind of dwindled down, and I wanted to take my intern at the time to, to go see if we could find the gators. And there's one particular spot where there's only two good observation areas. You now all the rest is, is really forested. So we went to the one area, and sure enough, we had this big one laying out there, and this one's a one I normally see out there, normally in that area, and sometimes she's there in that one spot for days, and it seems like she moves sometimes. So I know I've seen the big one. I knew there was only one big one that I knew of. I knew there were some smaller ones. Cool. So we're, we're driving around, and we're trying to look for places that normally we wouldn't be able to get to in the summer because of vegetation and stuff, but, you know, it's February, things happen, you know, Grown or anything, and I see a spot. I say, hey, I think we could walk and check out that spot. And so we're walking, and I get to the, the the bank, and I can tell that something had been messed around with the ground. I didn't know if it was like a deer had been bedding down. You just tell that things had been disturbed. So I'm sitting there with my binoculars, and I'm, I'm scanning the, the outer banks, I'm scanning the, the inner banks, and I get real quiet up to where I am, and I look, and when it clicked in my head. That's an alligator tail. I think it clicked in that alligator's head, oh, that's a human. Because instantaneously the alligator got up on his legs, turned around, and was facing me, and I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm probably about here to you. Alright? I froze in panic. I'm like, oh, I'm here all I'm here also. How fast can they run again? Am I supposed to zigzag? Am I supposed to zigzag? Right? So I luckily retreated back, heart pumping, ran back, got the camera, was able to take some pictures of this guy. So we have at least two big ones in this area. And it was every bit of 10 foot, if not more. Um, so yeah, almost stepped on that gator. Uh, so let's move on to the conclusion of thoughts. Yes, we do have alligators. There is evidence to suggest that we had a native population. All right, we'll never be able to, to tell the truth on that. Yes, we know that babies were, you know, from the pet trade were being released. I've met people who have said they have released their old pets back in the day at Wheeler. But we have some evidence to at least suggest that there is a possibility we always had a native population. These sizes are going to increase. You know, as urbanization you know, continues and we're moving into their habitat, of course we're going to have more sightings, just as the case that we we'll receive over near Grissom. Um, you're more likely to hurt drive, driving, you probably for more uh, the danger driving here to come here to this talk than you probably are of going and seeing an alligator. But still, why aren't we seeing those high numbers? You know, even 150, even 200, that's, that's relatively low for a 35,000 acre refuge. Why are we still seeing lower numbers? And here are my thoughts. One, poaching. All right? We have a lot of recreation on these waters, one being, and I'm not saying this is a, a, that was happening, I'm just saying it could. You have people out there bow fishing at night, they have the right equipment, they're right there at the time when alligators are active. We have fat alligators, the arrows in the back. Um, we know there is poaching, just to what limit there is. Uh, you know, people will leave their, their hooks for fishing, just left there sometimes. Uh, there's also can be cannibalism. Uh, there was an alligator that was found, I believe, this October, and dead in North Alabama, and I guess the person who saw it thought, hey, this looks like it's probably a gator on gator thing. It had bite marks in the head, chunks of stuff missing off. So they can be, you know, territorial and everything else. Um, also the breeding, that's kind of interesting. We haven't found any nests, but the alligators have this thing called thermal sex determination, right? So when they're incubating in the nest, the temperature of that nest will determine if you have 
you know, boys or girls. Now, we're very north for where normal alligators are. So is there something going on that could be affecting the temperature? We, we might have a, a gender-biased population. You know, we have a whole bunch of females and a lot of males, or, or vice versa. Um, if anybody wants to do some research, you know, that'd be an awesome one. If you can find the nest. Uh, but yeah, I do think there, there is poaching uh, occurring. To give you another statistic, so I said 0 0.01, that's averaging to all refuge. That one spot that I told you that was 2.25 alligators, that's behind not only one, but two sets of locked gates. Very restricted to get into that area. <laughs> so I'm going to let that number, that it, maybe it's habitat, or maybe it's just because they have the extra protection. Okay. So how about whooping cranes? Is he controversial? No. No? <laughs> Can anybody think of any reason why whooping cranes might be controversial? Huh? They're not from here. They're not from here. Alright, that's one we hear a lot when it comes to the alligator, when we talk about whooping cranes. No, that one's rarely mentioned. So yeah, if you look at the historical range of whooping cranes, here in Alabama they, they did have some historical records, uh, mainly down the, in the coastal area, but certainly not up here in North Alabama. Alright, so here's the native range right here. Here's the native wintering range right here. So yeah, they're not, they're not supposed to be here, same case as, as the alligators, apparently. She already mentioned some of this, but for some of us who didn't uh, get to catch that, uh, there are 15 species of cranes in the world, 11 are threatened or endangered, the whooping crane being the most endangered out of all those. And once again, we do have two species you can find here in, in North America, the whooping crane and the sandhill crane. So how rare are we talking? All right, what's rare? So pre-1870, their abundance was resting to be about 13 to 1400, still not a lot even back then. All the way back in the 1940s, and depending on which statistic you're using, sometimes it's 14, sometimes it's 20, it depends. We had a very small number, 14, 21, it doesn't matter. This is a species we almost lost. All right, like I said, there's this room right here is almost two of those populations that were left. In the early 1900s, some of those breeding sites that we knew in the northern U.S. started disappearing. The last nest uh, in Saskatchewan, which was a known breeding site, was found in 1926. And still today, they are the top 10, in the top 10 endangered bird list for the United States. I'd say they're probably in the top five. So what? Number two? Yeah, so they're, they're up there. Um, but then there was wood buffalo, all right? So Wood Buffalo National Park, so for years they were seeing these birds overwintering in the Texas coastal area around Aransas and stuff like that, but then they would disappear and no one knew where these birds were going and breeding. Well, one day, one day in Wood Buffalo National Park up in Canada, there was a forest fire and a helicopter's going and doing a survey and he looks down and he sees some white birds, some big white birds. He goes, went back to a biologist, they're like, I think those are whooping cranes. They made two excursions to find these birds, both failed. They made one last attempt to get dropped in by a helicopter, and this story alone is pretty amazing. It took 31 days of a lot of grief, but let it be known that at 2 p.m. on this day, 23rd June, we are on the grounds with whooping cranes. 31 days. We're talking about dropped in, they were having to paddle, they had to be on foot. That's an excursion. As you can imagine, yeah, try going 31 days and that <laughs> to find some whooping cranes. But what's funny is, if you look at the Wood Buffalo National Park, it gets its name because this was a, a park that was set up for the preservation of another at-risk species, the Wood Buffalo. So if we didn't have that protection for the Wood Buffalo back then, we might have fully lost whooping cranes. So now we know where there are nesting sites for whooping cranes. And this is where a lot of the, the, the conservation that we know started for whooping cranes. So, Use your egg here. Go for it. So the cool thing about whole, I don't know if it's cool or not, but it's a it's fact. Uh, whooping cranes usually lay two eggs. It's about the size of a whooping crane egg, right? They lay two, but usually only one hatches and survives. Okay. So what people did is they would go and they would take one of those eggs, bring it to a facility, and that's how we start our captive breeding programs. 
as you can see, and here's some examples. So here's the babies. So these are juvenile whooping cranes. You can tell with the, you know, the, definitely different from the adults. They all have a, the brown plumage. Um, cues can be, uh, but then you see them, they're releasing into their pins. There's been a lot of different methods. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so some of the recovery efforts. So basically, we were getting the, the, the native population. There's only one native population left. The ones that breed up here in Wood Buffalo, and they winter down here in this National Wild Adventures. That's the only one that we know is left. But they wanted to have a reserve population of these guys for many reasons. Um, one, say something catastrophic happened to the, the native population, such as disease, you know, that could wipe out a whole thing. I forget the name of the hurricane, I, I, but one of the major hurricanes that hit just a few years ago hit directly out of range of this National Water Refuge. Uh, it might have. It might have. So, and it did a lot of damage. Luckily, the birds weren't there, but that's the kind of catastrophic event that we're talking about that could potentially wipe out a good chunk of that wild population. population. But they have tried to do some of these uh, icons introduced, some say reintroduced, but that's, you know, tomatoes, tomatoes. Um, they did try it in the Rocky Mountain area down here. That failed. They tried a uh, Florida non-migratory flock. That also failed. But we have two that are ongoing. The one that I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth is the eastern migratory population. The, the goal is for the breeding grass to be here and see the National Water Bay Beach, and also the original goal was to winter in Florida. There's also a Louisiana non-migratory population that's also uh, ongoing and is doing pretty well from what I've heard. So, so what? Are they? <laughs> That's crazy. I know. <laughs> How do you convey to a wooden crane where you want him to winter? Yeah. Well, we're back. We're going to talk about that right now. Um, after this, so EMP they were established back in 2001. Uh, they're considered experimental, not essential. Uh, there's a lot of legal loopholes and stuff they had to go through in order to. You know, release birds out, they can be on private property, and you know, a lot of people who have private property, they find out they have a native species on their land, they kind of flip out to think the government's going to come and take all their land. Um, so they had to do some classification for these guys, but once again, the goal was to breed in Wisconsin, overwinter in Florida. But these efforts were really hands-on. Really amazing, but really hands-on. So I'm sure some of y'all might have seen the people dressed in the whooping crane puppets uh, costumes, Try to you know teach the, teach whooping crane how to be whooping crane without imprinting human behavior. Um, once again, it's controversial. It's hands on, right? You're, we're we're sitting here thinking we know how a whooping crane should act, all right? Also, to your question, this is how they were teaching these birds how to fly to Florida. They were teaching them using ultralight aircraft. They would train the birds to get familiar with the aircraft, and they would leave the leave Wisconsin, and they would fly to Florida. All right, this was called Operation Migration. Um, but here's the thing. After that, it's up to the bird to return to Wisconsin, if it chooses to return to Wisconsin. And the years after, it's up to the bird to make its decision on where it wants to go. So it's, it's, you know, so it's the bird's choice. Now they're using more hands-off techniques. They're called what's called a, a direct auto release. Similar, they're raising them in captivity, but then they're releasing them out in the wild. Um, there's also a parent here that should be reared, not released. Basically, we're having whooping cranes actually raise babies in captivity. And then when they release them out in the wild, they try to do it around a pair that probably tried to nest that season but was unsuccessful, hoping they might have some, you know, some maternal, paternal, you know, hope of adopting a baby. Um, and there's been some fun stories with this. How but did they get the birds to follow that plan? It's a, it's a, lot, of, um, a lot of work. They, they have... Speak, at least they had speakers near the thing. The person is dressed like is, is in the costume. But Operation Migration ended. A lot of people were upset about this. Because these were very passionate people. Don't get me wrong. There were so many people who put a lot of work, blood, sweat, and tears, and raised a lot of money for these guys to be here. It was teaching them how to migrate. It wasn't teaching them tiny. And that's, so I think the last time they did this, they didn't get to Florida, uh, Florida till almost the end of January. By that time, birds are normally starting to pick up and go back north. So that's one of the issues. Is there was times when the birds can certainly fly, but the, the plane couldn't fly. In fact, that's one reason why we have a chunk of birds at Wheeler, um, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But once again, realize Wisconsin 
if not within this bed range, and also the winter range. So this is once again, we're like, hey, why are we picking these spots? Well, I will say there was a lot of effort going in. We knew there was a lot of habitat that was similar to what they were wanting. And it's not the fact that the birds aren't nesting, it's just they're having a hard time getting chicks to actually fledge and survive. Uh, predation is one. Black fly infestation is a big one that they did not consider when planning the site. So black flies, um, very nasty fly. They come out in swarms and basically they irritate the birds so much they abandon the nest. So they're also doing some things into like some re-nesting experiments to try to get the birds to re-nest at a later time to bypass some of the black flies. So there's still a lot of efforts going on with this and a lot of stuff is going on. Today, once again, these numbers probably have changed a little bit. We're up to or, you know around 800 birds. Major success compared to something we only had 20 back in the 1940s, right? But you gotta remember, a good chunk of these are still in captivity. Uh, what is the official number for EMP right now? Do you know? Um, total 806, EMP 75, okay. Louisiana 76. Okay, so now we have 75. All right, there still are some birds that Florida non-migratory. Um, population that are still kicking it, but they're just not, they're not bringing any new birds down there by that effort. So this comes to Wheeler. Like I said, the goal was for them to be at Florida, but we're seeing them at Wheeler. So the first individuals actually showed up in 2006, 2007. This was a pair that were actually uh, overwintering in Hiawassee National Wild Refuge up in Tennessee. Conditions got real bad. They ended up showing up at Wheeler. And I'm glad to say that one individual, 1302, he is officially the oldest member of this population and still chooses to come to Wheeler. All right? And once again, he was born in 2002, so he just celebrated, you know, just recently almost his, past his 20, 20, you know, 20 year birthday. We see the average lifespan is 24. That guy's been around. He's been fun to watch. But when I, was, when I came into the project about 2013, 14, 14, 15, we were getting about 25% of the population at Wheeler. So we're like, okay, something is going on at Wheeler. And even in North Alabama, we were getting up to 36%. So there are a few pockets here in North Alabama, outside of Wheeler, where we're getting some whooping grains. Are you saying 36% of that 802 number? No, out of the eastern migratory population. Okay. So the um, side of this number. And it, and, it, and it was up to, when I, at the height of my research, I believe we had just a little over 100 birds. So. Once again, if we're getting 36 of the population, I know it doesn't sound like 36 birds doesn't sound like a lot, but if you look at the proportion of it, that's, that's quite a bit choosing North Alabama as their wintering home. So here you can see as the years go on, they keep going up and up. Right here, it's like 31 birds was the most I ever had in 2016, 17, 18. And the numbers seem to be fluctuating um, around that range. You said we already have 13. Uh, I've been refuge so far, do you think? Uh, yes, only refuge. Yeah. 15 in the state. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're still getting those similar numbers. It's got a lot of good public reaction, right? We got billboards over here telling you about cranes, a lot of work the ICF has done. It's been amazing in the outreach they've done. Um, we had a beer at one time for whipping <laughs> cranes. Uh, I don't recommend, you know, drinking one of these and trying to go check out the billboard, but, you know. Uh, also, Jim Henson, all right? Yes. Jim Henson. Thank you. Came out, uh, and they made... Hope, the mascot, right? So that's me and my daughter. We're at one of the first public appearances of Hope. So there's a lot of enthusiasm from, from a lot of people and organizations about these birds, and as they should. But these are some of the big questions. I'm not going to go all in all, but basically, you know, why, why North Alabama? Why Wheeler? You know, what are they doing? Everything else. And so my boss was push, pushing me to do the PhD. Do the PhD, PhD. I was like, nah, you know, I didn't know if I really wanted to go do a PhD. Final, finally, he will be down. Okay, let's do a PhD, but I want to do something close because we do a lot of stuff in Baykhead National Forest, and you know I don't want to be driving three hours a day just to and from the work site. So he chose Wheeler. He's like, how about he's, he loves birds? He's like, how about the whooping crane? And I thought to myself, I know this bird is so heavily monitored. I, you know, I, I, what am I going to be able to tell people about whooping cranes? You know, what, what can I add to the table? It turns out, kind of similar to the alligator situation with a little bit more, yes, they were well monitored. They knew which individuals were coming to Wheeler. They would roughly know what kind of habitat, but no one ever came in and did the boots on the ground research of trying to answer some of these questions. 
Um, you know, what, how are they actually using these habitats? Yeah, I see them in a cornfield, but how is that being influenced by uh, food availability and things like that? So we came in 2014 to 2019, so for five years I was tracking these birds. Uh, this is some of the methodology coming in. Obviously a scope, uh, radio telemetry, which I'll tell you about here in a minute. But you'll notice we have to know what birds we're talking about. So you see these leg bands right here? Every bird will have a band combination. So there's different kinds of bands. Here's some larger ones. Typically we see these kind of mounts on sand cone frames. Um, these big colored bands, I'll come over and check this out afterwards, um, that has a combination. So I feel I can look at you know, those leg bands and I can look at a little chart here and I can look up, so, okay, which individual am I actually looking at? Okay? You might not be able to see it, but there's also something, a long antenna sticking out right here. So a lot of these birds, when they're releasing the captivity, they have a transmitter put on them right here with this guy. And I can use telemetry to find out where these birds are at. Okay? So a lot of telemetry, a lot of trying to ID them, a lot of videotaping. So we took over over 100 hours worth of film that I had to go back and review, just you know, watching birds be in, field, in fields. You know, are they eating? Where are they eating? How are they interacting with other birds? Um, another big component of this research was food availability, right? So we went did a lot of stuff in cornfields. We did this is what I used for, for wetlands. And of course, that is not a Aquatic species, that's my son. Um, I will tell you, these, some of these birds and animals can be predictable. This is the real wildlife right here. They keep you guessing all the time. So a lot of stuff is on food. Um, and there's a good reason because of that, because we know that food is energy, right? That's what's driving a lot of these birds to migrate in the first place. And, and, and where they're going to be at is based on food availability. Uh, there's also another way that we can find these birds. Uh, some of these birds actually have satellite tags equipped to them. So I didn't normally use this as much, but you know, we can go in here, we can see where this certain individual was kind of hanging out, that, that migration, where it overwintered and stuff like that. This is a great tool. It, it's, it's limited in its, in its scope where, okay, we know where they're at. We don't know what they're actually doing. There's a degree of accuracy there. So it's like, okay, is it, I, I can't tell you if it's in a wetland or if it's in uh, a field in some cases. Um, but it helps if I don't have hey, seen this bird on this refuge for a while. Is it still here? Can look and see if it's departed or not. So some of the result, results, uh, you know, we reserve, uh, observed a total of 51 different individuals. Okay, only three were wild chicks. All right, actually wild-born chicks. I should say we had some more babies in that, but only three babies that actually were born in the wild that made it to you. Uh, we did have one Louisiana non-migratory bird show up. He's like, I don't know what this non-migratory business is about. I'm going to go check out Wheeler. <laughs> so that kind of threw us all for a loop. Just, you know, it's supposed to be, you don't normally migrate north, but hell well. He came and checked us out for a year or two. Um, we know that foraging is mainly done on the croplands. And we know there is some relationship between the, for the foraging sites and the roosting sites. So like she said earlier, these birds, they, they roost in wetlands. And then during the day, they'll go to these fields to forage and things like that. They do not roost in trees. I remember I went to a property one time and was telling this gentleman, who uh, he didn't own the property, but he was on the property. And um, I was telling him what I was doing, looking for the whooping crane. And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I see them white birds all the time. I see hundreds of them roosting in these trees. And I was like, oh, okay. You're thinking about egrets. <laughs> I was like, but I'm not going to argue with a man that has a 357 uh, you know, hanging out his overalls, so like, you know, decisions, right? Decisions. When it comes to habitat, this is an example of what I'm talking about. So this is an area that is used for roosting, but in this current state, it is not available for whooping cranes. This is what we need. All right, so just lower, when the water level is real low, you all these expands, uh, sandbars, uh, good places for roosting, you have islands, so they're kind of separated from uh, the land habitat. And unfortunately, a few of the years that we were out there, we had major flooding events. So we would see how that would impact. Sometimes these birds were forced to uh, roost other places. That they've been roosting sometimes outside of the observation building, you know, not where you never typically want them to be. So a lot of these birds sometimes just pick up and leave, right? So some of those years we have those numbers. It's a few of those years that we usually had a lot of flooding or some other issues that prevented birds from, from staying here longer. But um, 
One cool aspect of this is, is just be able to watch these birds. They're such charismatic species. And, uh, you know, we get to see interactions like this. And you'll see them kind of do their maneuvers. They'll kind of dance around. And I was like, nope, get out of here. All right? <laughs> Uh, Y'all heard us talking earlier uh, about a certain bird. I will say Reba. Thanks. Um, some of them don't hear any bandit. I thought they were. So, so basically, what you're saying these are all sandhill cranes. This is the only whooping crane in the picture. So yeah, all these sandhill cranes, most of them are not banded. But I tell you what, if you find a banded one. People from ICF are going to be super excited about it. Just let me know, baby. Yeah, if you see a <laughs> I found one one year. She said, oh, that's more exciting than finding a whooping crane. <laughs> so, apparently there are needles in the haystack out there. So, the three chicks, were you able to ban them? The wild ones? Yes. Sometimes they're able to, but sometimes they're not. We have a, there is a wild hatch chick that was on the refuge last year that still does not have bands, and it is back on the refuge right now. Yeah, so it's... There are cases, they do try, but obviously when they're, when they're wild hatched, they don't want to go and disturb anything. And so if they can, they will, but they don't push it that much. Um, <coughs> this is 1415, otherwise known as Reba. So once again, it's taking footage, seeing is it successful eating? Usually when they cock their head back, that means it's a successful strike. Um, you know, we want to know if they're whooping cranes or how they're going to the same hill cranes, such as this right here. But, no, get out of here. <laughs> so even our baby whooping cranes are coming in for showing they're showing dominance over the sandhill crane. So getting that kind of interaction is what we're kind of looking for. She's we also still, she still does that. Yeah. So we also see some other really cool interactions with other species, um, bird on bird fights. So over here we have a bald eagle swooping down, harassing a whooping crane, and over here we have a whooping crane chasing off a bald eagle. And I've seen them just sitting side by side, not even caring about each other, right? But predation is always a factor, and one of the predators that could be a, a factor are these guys right here. Now, I was filming some whooping cranes one day. They're, they're far away, I'm zoomed out, and I see something black just trot along the, the line towards the whooping cranes. I'm like, what is that? And I look, and I, I just see this, this big, big black canine, I was like, wolf! I'm like, no, I can't be a wolf. That's the first thing that popped in my mind. But sure enough, and there was a second one running behind them. And so I set up some game camps, and sure enough, there's these beautiful black coyotes. All right, they were just gorgeous, but they just walked by the cranes, cranes didn't pay me any attention, nothing. I've seen, I've seen cranes get all disturbed and, you know, worried about coyotes, but one of the best videos I ever took in, and unfortunately, the ones that I lost, um, where there was four, four whooping cranes all along the field, no sand hills, and this coyote comes trotting out there, and these four whooping cranes chased off that coyote. I'm mean, like, yeah, these are big birds, you know, five foot tall. They're, they're just flapping the wings, and they scared, you know, scared off the coyote. Now, good, I'm doing good on time. A um, little bit of story time. You know, I was thinking, you know, I've, I've tracked these birds for five years, that's one of the one rewarding things about this, is that, there are certain individuals for this population I got to track five years in a row. Mm -hmm. You know, and you start building a little bit of a relationship with these birds, you start learning the birds, you learn, okay, I know this bird wants to hang out here. If he's not here, oh, I bet so and so is over there. You really get to learn, you know, what they like to do. They're very charismatic, they're fun to watch. So I have tons of stories that I could tell about whooping cranes. Um, once again, 1415, this was on the refuge just a few days ago. So if you're on the refuge and you're at the observation building, you have a high chance of seeing Reba here. Um, Does Reba have a red patch on her head? So what? Is that some marking that they normally have? No, they do. They'll, they'll get a red patch on top of their head. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, she has more of a red neck. Yeah. yeah. And then they do, they do vary a little bit. Of course, it also depends on the, the quality of photography that you have that shows that. Um, this would be green right here. I don't even remember its number, but what's crazy to me is it's laying down. Mm -hmm. All right. Out of five years tracking these birds, this one individual is like the only one that would ever lay down. Mm -hmm. All right, so I was like, that was pretty cool. I could talk about our probably more famous couple of whooping cranes, Bo and Latka. Uh, this is Bo right here. This is Latka right here. This is Latka actually nesting up in Wisconsin. So Bo actually got here 
in 2011, or not, yeah, 2011, and he was a part of one of those groups on Operation Migration, and they got actually stopped in, I believe, Tennessee, all right? The TSA would not let them fly, so they're like, here, we got all these cranes, what are we going to do with these cranes? And they finally decided to take him on to Wheeler. So we have a, a big group of the 2011 class of birds that still come to Wheeler, and Bo is one of them. But then we have 5913, means she was born in 2013. She's there. She was there. Her first, her first wintering was at Wheeler. Um, everything's going good. And they started hanging out in the same area. They'd be in the same fields, right? Next year, they kind of be a little closer. And so we're all rooting for it. We're all rooting for it. Oh, come on, Bobo Sure enough, by year three, they are officially a mated couple, and they've been together ever since. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't believe they have actually produced any wild horn chicks, but they're trying. Mm -hmm. But when I thought of the stories to tell, and um, my wife's here, so she'll love this one, <laughs> I have to talk about 3808. All right? Good story, kind of sad, a funny story. This is 3808 when she was a baby. This is her leg combination. You know, if you're ever reading this, if you ever see a bird that's made, you go left leg first, then right, go top down, top down. So red, white, red, white, green. This is 3808 uh, with her mate at the time, and unfortunately in 2012, 3808, and she's a female by the way, the male was no longer, be, was no longer seen. It was, went missing, and, but they did make a note, or made it a point to state that there were a lot of alligators in the area. Alright, so 3808's mate possibly got eaten by an alligator. Full circle there, full circle, pulled it in. Alligators would be crazy. Um, <laughs> after that, though, when, especially when she came to Wheeler, she was just kind of a third wheel. She'd just kind of hang out with a, another mated pair. I don't know if she was trying to you know, cause some drama or what, but anyway, she was picked on. She, birds were chasing her off, this and that. She was kind of low. She was trying to be social, but she got picked on a lot. And one year, actually, one year, um, I think this was the second year that I was there. All the birds had left, you know, February, whatnot. So, okay, whooping crane season's over with. Um, I can't keep still. I do stuff during the summertime, such as the alligators. I was also doing turtle research out there. So, I think I was doing turtle research at the time. And I'm driving down the field, and I look over, and I see a big white bird in an impoundment. This is June. Got out my binoculars, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Turns out it was 3808, right? Mm -hmm. So for many weeks in June, I'm going back and checking on it, and I, I was getting upset. You know, my wife can tell you, I sometimes cry about this bird. I was like, oh, she's out there by herself, so there's no other birds to be social with, there's tons of coyotes out there. I was really worried about 3808. <laughs> but one day I went to go check on her, because even though I'm not taking data on her, I still care about her, I want to know what's going on. I see her, and then she just kind of walks away from me. She walks away from me, and she's in a little wetland impoundment. She goes where I can't see her. I go to a point where I can see her again. And this thing scoots back and is hiding from me. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This thing, I, in my mind, maybe it's not what she was doing, but she distinctly backed up. And I was like, she's hiding from me. I've never seen a whoop cream hide from me. They usually fly or they run off. They usually fly if they're, if they're threatened. Because they're hiding. But she would do this multiple times where she would see, and she would go to a spot where you couldn't see her and everything else. One time she was in the middle of the field, and she sees me, she starts walking towards the woods. I'm kind of keeping my pace, kind of keeping my pace. She walks into the woods. Once again, I have never seen a whooping crane walk into the woods. I'm like, what's going on? Right? So I take off to see what she's doing in the woods, and so apparently she'd walk through, I guess there was a wetland on the other side, because I couldn't find her. She didn't come back, but now we're thinking, okay, she's not flying from us. Mm -hmm. Is she hurt? Can she fly? Well, this being an endangered species, I can't just go run and try to flush this bird. So we went through, we went through the proper, cha proper channels, and we were able to actually, we got grant uh, permission from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to go try to flush this bird. So me, Dwight Cooley, who's old manager of the refuge, Bill Gates, biologist at the time, a few other volunteers. It took much longer than it should have. Um, too many biologists in the pot there, okay? But we surround this bird, and we're hiding in the woods, and everybody's like, I guess waiting for the other person to make their first move. Then Dwight just goes out there, flushes the bird, 
flies off, right? So 38 could fly. She eventually left July 4th weekend, all right? So stay here in an abnormally long time. And uh, unfortunately, 3808 has not been seen in a few years, and has presumed it, all right? That's the sad part, but I'll never forget 3808 because she was such a crazy bird. And that's sometimes the downside because you do follow, you know, you do become attached to some of these birds. From a research point of view, sometimes that can conflict things. Um, but it's also something you all can do too. That's the thing about the resource. You, you can go online. If you know which birds you really want, you can throw all reports are put out there. You can see, check them if that bird um, laid a nest that year, if they had any babies, are they still alive? This is all information that you all can get from the well, Whooping Crane Eastern Partnership uh, websites. Uh, the Journey North Operation Migration thing has a lot of good historical information about some of these birds if they were born pre-2017. So you can get a lot of the backstory on the individuals, which has been really rewarding because you just got to deal with the community. All right, now I'm actually talking about individuals. And it's been very, very rewarding for me. So there's been many trials, many failures, but mainly success. We're getting these numbers up. But the future of the EMP is uncertain. All right, if we had to put a dollar amount on each one of these birds, they estimated that it's roughly about $100,000 per bird. And that was years ago. I'm sure it's more now. So obviously, at some point, if we're not seeing much success on the breeding end and everything else, Uncle Sam may say, hey, I'm not flipping the bill for this anymore. All right? Hopefully it doesn't happen, but it certainly could. So kind of wrapping it up. Controversial does not always mean bad. Okay, it's okay. It's okay to ask questions. All right, it's okay to be critical. All right, I would rather ask questions and figure out. Okay, you know, why did you do that? Did it work? Did it not work? Because in the end, I would say I would rather us try something that's controversial and fail than do nothing at all and lose a species which could have happened in this case. And it's interesting enough, both these animals were both released for reintroductions. Right? Or to reestablish establish reserve populations. Right? So, with that being said, and it brings me to another point, not only to the species, but you know, a few years ago we had a lot of flooding. Right? It knocked out one of these, one of these bridges, and it turns out there was an endangered snail there. Right? Awesome controversy, right? Because it delayed the project of the, the bridge. It was going to cost a lot more extra money. And I remember hearing a local radio host talk about this very angrily. And I get it. Yeah, people, you know, sometimes we need to streamline some things. And obviously the money is always an aspect. But, you know, his attitude was just, you know, kill the snail. Right? What's a snail to us? And I remember thinking how self-important sometimes we think we are, you know? and how we go about this. Um, but we can't just always think about ourselves, all right? Because once again, we have our young ones that are coming in to take our reins, their young ones after that. And we're obviously losing a battle when it comes to conservation far and wide. But yeah, to finalize it up, basically, you know, we, ha we have to try. That's why I love the land trust so much, because we're constantly out there preserving land left and right when they can, and preserve sure good quality land too. All right, now these species aren't on land trust property yet, but we're hoping one day they will, okay? <laughs> so with that being said, um, I'll be more than happy to take some questions. I know the library does close in 30 minutes, so we have to be out of here in 30 minutes, <laughs> but also here to answer some questions that you want to talk. Um, also, if you have it, please you know, ask Jesse some questions, check out our booth, get some more information on ICF if you want, and thank you so much for being here. Okay.